Hey everyone, Gaijin here. Well, I, I was going to put together a video today talking about how clothing can actually be one of your greatest tools for grassroots diplomacy when it comes to being a Gaijin in Japan, but um, I, I, I saw a video that... Well, just to be completely honest, it, it made me want to talk about this. Now, this criminally underviewed video, by the way, was called Why I Love Japan and Why It Took Me So Long to Realize It by Pat K. And what Pat K did was just basically talk about his life experience of, of how things in his childhood kind of shaped and reflected his ultimate love of Japan. And having not been able to be back in Japan for the entirety of 2020, it kind of gave me a lot of thought and pause about, you know, what is it about my life, you know, that, that, that really got me into loving Japan? Because the funny thing is, uh, about all this, is that you all only know about nine years of a 20-year journey <laughs> when it comes to my life. I've talked about a little bit of my life prior to uh, my time starting up uh, my YouTube career as Gaijin Goomba, but... Um, yeah, there's a lot that's still not there, and a lot that I've still not really talked about. And, like I said, not being able to go back to Japan, because even after I came home from working abroad, I still went back and visit every single year. Uh, even twice in 2019. Uh, ever since about 2014. And this being the first time that I haven't been able to get back there, it just made me think a whole lot about, you know, what is it that got me into all this? Because I kind of realized something after, after watching this this other video, and that's not being in Japan has made me realize something. And that's when I reconnect with Japan, when I go back to visit, when I go back and re-experience and, and breathe in that old life that I had, I'm reconnecting with some of the truest parts of myself that I've been building for my entire lifetime, that have been built for as long as I can remember. From as far back as some of the earliest memories that, I, that I've ever had as a human. And so what I wanted to do was just kind of fill in those gaps. Like, like I said, you guys only know half the story. I kind of want to fill in where the rest of this came from. You know, where, where my love came from of, of Japan. And maybe it's something that you can reflect on too. Maybe it's something that you can relate to. Or maybe it's just something that you've been curious about that I've, I've never really talked about and I really ever haven't. So some of the earliest memories that, that I have just as a sentient being um, is is playing the good old Nintendo Entertainment System and particularly the Mega Man franchise, uh, mostly five. It wasn't just video games. It's like, I remember that during my brother's soccer game, uh, I had my bicycle helmet on. I don't remember why, but I remember I found this, this, this chunk of wood that I swear looked exactly like a uh, Tive Torpedo from, from like Dive Man. I just remember just playing that by myself, pretending to be Mega Man. And, and it's interesting that that's my very first one because Mega Man was something that introduced to me something that's very, very Japanese, and that is the question of artificial intelligence. You can look at you can look at everything from Mega Man to Astro Boy to even something as recent as Near Automata, and you have this concept or this question of of existential identity when it comes to artificial intelligence. Like, are we sentient? Do we have a soul? Are we human? I mean, that's something that almost Japan exclusively has been looking through and, and, and going over just Kind of in general. Robotic use in Japan has just been trying to skyrocket. And as far as the aging society problem goes, one of the three solutions that I think Japan's going to find 40 years down the line when over half the people are too old to work is trying to figure out artificial intelligence and doing it safely. But again, that's just that's one little thing. All that stuff about Japan and one little thing back when I was like seven. I mean, I remember too, like... I, some of you may be, be way too young to remember this, but one of the first instances of Pokemon ever being exposed to the United States was over in Topeka, Kansas. For one day, Topeka was called Topeka Chu. And trust me, this is, this is not the first time that Topeka decided to rename itself into something else in order to get attention from people. But this was, the, it was this huge event. I actually, my, my mother actually cut me out of school to go to this event because it was that important. Pokemon was just such a huge deal for me as a kid. So I, I remember going to this, this, it was this big open field and there were all these tents everywhere with showcasing the game and, and there were like plush prizes and stuff. I remember some kid had a Charizard plush and I'm like, ooh, I want that. But the big event was like this, this big Pikachu drop from, from like a helicopter or something like that. But I mean, my point is, is that this thing that I got super hyped for, that I was utterly pissed at because 
the day that I was supposed to go pick it up with my, my mom and my dad, they, they had to work late and I was so mad because I couldn't get my hands on it at the time that I was supposed to. The very concept of Pokemon in its entirety is almost exclusively rooted in, in, in Japanese culture. It's, it's Beetle Sumo. That's where the whole concept came from. I think we all kind of understand that now. But it's not even just that. It's like so many of the different Pokemon themselves are inspired by other yokai or folklore creatures or folk stories or things like that. And that's what I mean. Little seeds getting planted in little Gaijin's brain, right? And, and oh man, let's talk about Super Mario Bros. 3 for a hot second. If you want if you want an example of a game that defied an entire generation, Super Mario Bros. 3 is the one. <laughs> and that's what introduced... The Tanuki suit. And I think we, we, we've all come to the agreement that back then, we know what it was. We didn't know why this 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 onesie Mario, like, raccoon suit made, turned him into some kind of statue holding the stick. And uh, But we didn't care because we were, we were able to, to stomp out uh, piranha plants. We didn't care. It made us invincible. But the fact that it was there is something that planned itself in my brain, as I'm sure it did for a lot of people. And what ended up coming from that was the introduction of myself into my YouTube career. One of the first videos that I ever made talked about the Tanuki suit, explaining where it came from, why it did what it did, and how it was very uniquely Japanese. It, it really was the biggest catalyst for me to create online content, and, you know, nine years later, here I am. And Ninja! Oh lord! <laughs> Anyone living in the 80s and 90s can tell you that Ninja were freaking everywhere. From from cartoons, not anime, from cartoons like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, to video games like Ninja Gaiden, Strider, Ninja Warriors. Ninja were freaking everywhere. And they still kind of are. I mean, you could take all this information about Ninja from the 80s all the way to today and make an ongoing web series talking about all the inspirations behind them. Oh wait, that's right. I've already done that and I'm still doing it. But see, here's the thing. These were the seeds that were planted in my head as a young kid. I didn't really think about Japan, and I, I, I couldn't even imagine how all of these things were even connected to Japan, except for maybe Ninja, but who cares? You know, Ninja were awesome. That, that was the bottom line for, our, for, for 7 to 12 year old Gaijin. So then we come to junior high and high school for me, and this was the beginning of the anime boom of the 90s. Now, I don't have to explain what that did to our entire generation. I, I don't have to go into the... the extraneous details about how that affected uh, our entire generation in general. There are lots of other people who have made documentaries about it who did it way better than I ever could. But there are a handful of things that I absolutely want to echo because these are things that helped me get more invigorated to learn more about Japan. Anime was something that looked familiar to us when we were kids, you know? Anime is, is, is no more than just the animation in general. That's what cartoons were. That's what, that, that's kind of the style of media that we grew up with. But the tone of all these different new shows that we were seeing, all of them were so much more mature. So in a very real way, something that maybe older people don't really understand. Mom, Dad, if you're watching, I hope you understand this. Anime was a bridge between early adolescent youth and childhood to adulthood. It's like... It's like anime at the time understood that its audience was making a transition from childhood into adulthood. And so it's what started off as a medium with with even tropes that we recognize, wild takes, things like that. I remember Roni, Roni Kenshin was really big with that. Taking that and adding so many more mature themes and topics, that's what made it click. That's what made it work. And that's how we kind of changed and became more interested in more adult things. And I don't mean perverse, I just mean adult. In fact, there were five specific, there were, there were five anime specifically that basically kind of, you know, not only got me more interested in Japan, but really transformed me from a kid to an adult in very mature and real ways. These being Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, Trigun, Tenchi Muyo, and Gundam Wing. I would say that there are some runners up, you know, Outlaw Star, Big O, G Gundam, but I mean, these are the five that really changed me as an individual and really changed my perspective on a lot of things. Dragon Ball Z, for instance, really did teach me about how to find strength in the face of just abject adversity. 
For those of you that don't know Dragon Ball Z, one, go watch it. Two, it, it had a cyclical story about a bunch of people who were strong, a big powerful enemy shows up, and the and then the main character struggled to become stronger, and most of the time beat this big bad just by the skin of their teeth, but they pushed through, you know? They trained, they got stronger, they overcame. Dragon Ball Z is about overcoming. And that was a humongously, like, adult lesson that it taught me, is to not cower in the face of, of adversity, but strengthen yourself and get over it, push through it, become better, and beat it. And through Dragon Ball, something that was that was taught to me, really, uh, was the Japanese concept of Gaman, which is to endure and to push through and, and to just and just just fight your way through, you know, to not really to, to not give up and just crumple up and, and, and fold over, but to really make it through. And that's that that's a very Japanese concept that was introduced to me through this anime before I even knew that this anime had any relation to Japan. So Sailor Moon, man. Sailor Moon, I know, is a lot of things for a lot of people, and I know for the majority of people, particularly ladies, it was a very, very empowering show to, sh to show that, that women were not only competent, but capable, and and essentially could do everything that, that men could do. You look at Sailor Moon, and you, and you look at other other Sentai series, and it's kind of it's kind of the same thing. Um, so it was really interesting seeing that sort of thing equated together. So, big empowering thing, I think that's great. Completely. But Sailor Moon for me was something very different. Sailor Moon for me was me trying to understand that femininity is okay for a guy. Being into more feminine things is okay as a guy. Because remember, this is back in the 80s and 90s. This is before we had any sort of cultural revolution about understanding ourselves. There was still so much pressure for a guy to only like manly things, to like the color blue, yada yada yada, you know the story. I remember sitting down with one of my counselors, and, and I asked them, and I'm like, there's this show that's for girls, that's for girls, <laughs> that I really like. I, I really like the characters, I really like the setting, I, I, I like all of it. Is that wrong? Imagine that. Imagine living in a world where you have to ask yourself, is that wrong? And what I came what I came out of was that no, it's not wrong. I mean at the very at the very most baseline, it's just media. If you like it, it's fine. If it's if it's all women, whatever. Is it a good show? If you like it, cool. Like that's what it should be. But again, I sat there and I was wrestling around with this idea of this is a show made for girls. Is it okay to like it? And yeah, it is. In fact, the one thing I learned from Sailor Moon 2 that has everything to do with Japanese society is that everyone can like cute things. Japan revolves around cute things, and it's not just women. It's not just women that are into it. Guys are really into it, and it's completely okay. I, I love it. <laughs> I, only, I only wish I could put those two pieces together, because it was only until I really started to, to, to see Japan's cute culture for what it is that I was like, man, I can like cute things too, that's awesome. So moving on to Trigun. Trigun's a really interesting one. Because Trigun to me taught me, and this is more of a, this is kind of going back to the whole Gaman kind of thing, but Trigun was all about making the best of a really bad situation. And it not, it not only was about the characters starting off in a really bad situation, because let's be honest, that's what it was. It had also so much more to do with dealing with bad situations that you keep falling, you keep falling into. Uh, there are a lot of characters that are gravely injured. There are characters that die. There are big events that happen, and it beats our main characters down. But the thing is, is that our main character, Vasha Stampede, is always cheerful, always happy, love and peace, and all that. That's something much like Dragon Ball that I, I really needed to see, and I really needed to come to grips with as a young adult, really going into adulthood f from a kid. And then there's Tenshi Muyo. Oh my goodness, Tenshi Muyo. <laughs> uh, Tenshi Muyo taught me a very, very important lesson uh, about myself and, and about, uh, about ladies. Uh, women are not only pretty, but they're pretty strong. I mean, that's one of the things that, that I... I still sit here and say that Tenshi Muyo is the best harem anime of all time. I say that because all these girls, all of them, even Mihoshi, all of them are really, really interesting, and they have their own really big strengths. They're not one notes. Uh, maybe Mihoshi is a little one note, but my point is, is that 
it wasn't the fact that these characters were pretty or beautiful or anything like that. I mean, don't get me wrong, Ryoko was still my number one waifu. The thing is, is that they were all capable. They all had lives, they had personalities, they had likes, they had dislikes, uh, they had weaknesses. You know, there were things about them that were bad, there were things about them that were good. And as I was transitioning from, from a very young man to a young man, that's something that I felt like really kind of helped me stay the course. Is that, you know, like I said, women are not only pretty, but they're pretty strong. And then Gundam Wing, oh boy. Now, you all gotta understand, I was too young to understand that war is heck. I mean, that's that's the statement that every, except for maybe G, uh, the statement that every Gundam ever makes. But I saw Gundam Wing as as like a, a junior high high school student, and all I could all I could see was whoosh kabang mecha. Robotech slash Macross, you know, back in the late '80s, early '90s, kind of introduced us over here in the West to the concept of mecha. But I think it was Gundam Wing that really solidified it. But I think looking at it now, it it, it did cover a lot of mature themes. It, it did really cover this idea that war causes people to suffer. Catra's experience with the Zero System really kind of encapsulates that. How it how war will take someone who is kind and gentle and completely warp them into, into a kind of a horrible person. And that kind of goes back to Japan's, you know, current idea of peace. I mean, Japan's been a warring society for a very, 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 very long time. But when you look at Japan now, it's just... Everyone wants to be at peace. And that's something that I felt like I was able to kind of take away from, from the whole Gundam experience. Now, all of that were basically seeds that were kind of planted in my head. And then the anime boom of the 90s was kind of the fertilizer that was being laid down. College. College is what made all of that grow. College created the in me, the, it gave me the biggest decision of my life. And when I was in high school, I was really, really pushing for acting. I, I did a handful of, of, of fun plays. I had a couple of interesting roles. I really loved drama. I really loved acting. And when I got into college at the very, very beginning, acting is what I really wanted to do. But after getting some lessons under my belt, getting some college courses under my belt, and really getting into a couple of different plays and seeing the magnitude in which I had to, to sacrifice in order to do them, I realized it just wasn't going to make me money. So from that, I kind of moved on to the stereotypical pursuit of making manga and anime, like every good we back in the 90s and early 2000s wanted to. But the problem there was that at least at my place of, of, of education, uh, my campus, it was discredited. Nowadays, we've got all different kinds of college courses for anime, manga, etc. I mean, it's, it's all over the place now. But back then, uh-uh. I had my portfolio of different art, and I remember my teacher looked at me and was like, you need to find your own style. You need to stop pretending and, and, and copying a whole bunch of art styles. So I'm like, I, I got really mad. <laughs> I'll just say I got really mad. And and through the process of, of that kind of rejection, I did discover that drawing manga style stuff became more of a hobby because it just wasn't something that I was really willing to put the torturous work into. I didn't enjoy the climb, so to speak. But... Then I went to go see a, a very particular movie with a couple of drama friends. I went to go see Kill Bill. First one. I hated Kill Bill. I really hated Kill Bill. Not because I think it was bad or, or it had bad cinematography or bad story or whatever. It was just, it was exceptionally violent and exceptionally cruel. And that's not what I want in my escapist fantasies. But I don't know why. But when it came to the fight between Uma Thurman and Lucy Liu, something clicked. It's like the seed had opened up and the, and the sprout came out. And something, something that felt really dormant, or something that was built up over time, finally clicked in my head. And after that movie, uh, my friends and I went to Barnes & Noble. And it was there that I got my very first Japanese to English dictionary and phrase book. And in fact... I still have it. This was printed in 2003. It was still pretty new when I picked it up. And I've had this thing for almost 20 years now. This is a testament. This is a, a physical testament to where my love for Japan really came through. And there was a lot in here. There was a lot in here for little gaijin to, to tear apart. I keep this very close to my heart specifically because of that. And 
after I realized this, after I, 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 I felt that seed burst open, I did everything that I could to, to really explore more of it. There were a couple of Japanese culture courses that my, my current uh, university offered, but nothing really substantial, and I was able to get into a few language classes, but those were kind of off the cuff. Those weren't official classes. So from there, from there it was trying to find a college where I could actually academically study not just Japanese as a language, but history, culture, um, sociology, everything, and I found it. And I poured my ever-loving heart into it. And I excelled at it. Not perfectly, you know, I, I wasn't the most top achiever, but I made consistently good grades. And, and all of that really did come thanks to my teacher's uh, anal retentiveness and openness, to, to be completely honest. Now, as far as big things that I've accomplished, one of those was I was selected for every single Japanese speech contest that I could have been a part of. I never won. <laughs> I never once won, but from from 2006, gosh, 2008, seven, you know, it was always it was always kind of runner up stuff. But as far as I knew, as all the teachers told me this, no one else had accomplished that. You know, no other student was able to to present their understanding of the Japanese language, you know, in, in a very comfortable way well enough to be selected for every single one of those because I had horrible <laughs> I had horrible stage fright I always got really really scared and panicky when I was talking in front of a lot of other people when I was speaking in Japanese for the brief times that I speak Japanese in these videos I've seen some people say hey it's kind of shaky it's kind of wrong I have stage fright <laughs> when it comes to talking with not just a couple hundred people like those contests but you know thousands tens of thousands of people you know <laughs> That stage fright's still there. But the thing is, is that I didn't want to just, you know, do well academically with Japanese. I wanted to do so extracurricularly, if that's even a word. So, of course, I participated in my in my in my college's anime club. In fact, one at one point I was actually the president of it. Yeah, I was a weep. I wholeheartedly admit that. So, yeah, I I was that guy. But th the thing is, is that when I did become president of the anime club, I was able to start incorporating aspects of culture into each meeting and the things that we watched. To me, that made the difference. You know, it wasn't just har har watching anime for anime's sake. It was, you know, watching anime and understanding a little bit more about Japan itself through this medium. And it wasn't all just anime. I I'm, I'm happy to say that it wasn't all just anime. Uh, I also worked a lot with the Japanese Student Association, or, or JSA. Uh, I performed Soranbushi with them, multiple times in fact. Uh, I helped put together one of their great big uh, in-house matsuris. And, and despite the limitations that we had, looking back on it now, yeah, it felt really authentic. And it was in that time I started making really good Japanese friends, and I, I, I kind of got a little bit more exposure on how friendships in that culture kind of worked. Eriha and Yoshi were two of my greatest friends. Yoshi was really, really kind. Uh, he helped me a whole lot with my Japanese. I was really happy to, to be able to hang out with him when I was actually uh, living and working abroad. I uh, got to meet his family. I don't know what happened with Eddie. I miss her a whole lot, but she was so happy and so full of energy. And yeah, with college came studying abroad. I, I was given the opportunity to uh, have a four-month program over at uh, Kanto Gakuin Daigaku in Yokohama. And... I could probably make multiple videos about these experiences. It was a heck of a four months, I'll tell you that right now. But the thing is, is that it was my first yet controlled experience uh, that I had with, with life in Japan. I'll, and I'll, I'll get to more about that in a minute, the difference between controlled and uncontrolled experiences. But the thing is, is that this is the first time where like sights and smells would ever be forever etched into my mind as being uniquely Japanese. Every single time I go back over, there are certain smells, certain foods, uh, the straw of tatami mats, things like that. There are little things that that stay with you. And I mean, this was this was also my first taste with a lot of other different things too. Uh, Japanese family life, school, traditional crafts, historical sites, theme parks, shrines, temples, traditional business, and even philosophy like Zen Buddhism. I, I was able to stay at, oh, what was it? Um, Daiyuzan Soul Joji, I believe, temple? I definitely need to go back, and I would love to do a video about a stay there, but I was able to stay 
there for a couple of days, was able to perform Zazen meditation with, with a lot of the other monks. That was super cool. Dived into to monk vegetarian food, which I didn't appreciate back then, but now looking back, realizing what it was that they offered, I'm like, yeah, that was actually really good. It just, ah! I want to go back and do it, and I would love to chronicle it as a video. Oh, it'd be so amazing. And holy cow, food. Speaking of food, this was the first time that I actually had real Real Japanese food, like, we're, we're, we're talking real ramen, real udon, nabe, real sushi, Japanese branch fast food, like Japanese McDonald's or Japanese Taco Bell or something like that, and natto, oh my god, this was the first time that I have experienced natto, and it was going to be the last time for sure, <laughs> but I did try it at least, but... This was also the first time that I got to experience some of the not-so-nice sides of Japan. I actually saw what work life did to families. I, for the first time, had a taste of frustration for, Japan, for Japan's lack of risk assessment and societal change. And the biggest one of all, this was the first time I ever experienced absolute crushing sense of unbelonging. And that's going to be its own video later. Boy, is that going to be its own video later. But that was the big one. But this was also the first time that I was actually able to share my own culture with people in Japan. I remember this one guy, Makoto. He was one of the first guys that I actually really got to share this with. Now, granted, I was telling him the meaning of different swear words and such. But I mean, I think that that's something that I think everyone needs to understand and not accidentally use to an English speaker. But it was really interesting because... This program that was supposed to culturally enrich me actually allowed me to culturally enrich other people through, through very meaningful discussions. And it was at this time I realized this is what I was meant to do, to be a bridge between countries. And in this case, to basically help Japan understand the US and foreigners in general a little bit better. I, that was, that was my purpose. That was my life's purpose. And I finally, could see it clear as day. So, then came graduation and destiny. Uh, I actually finished up, I finished up getting my BA in international relations with a double minor in Asian studies and Japanese. And it, it, it you know, I was kind of sad that I couldn't major in Japanese, but I did come away with, and sadly I'm still kind of at, somewhere between N3 and N4 speaking capability. It's funny, I get so many people that are like, Gaijin, what's it like to be fluent in Japanese? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not! I want to stay right here and now. I am not Japanese fluent. I'm functional. Big difference. <laughs> I function perfectly well as a tourist, and I could... I could function more or less pretty okay as an expat or, 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 or resident or whatever, but fluent? No. No, not at all. So don't put that evil on me. But the thing is, what I lacked in language, I made up for cultural understanding and, and intercultural analysis. And the goal, the, 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 the pot of gold at the, the, at the end of the rainbow, that was my, my six years in college at this point, was the JET program. <laughs> the thing about that, though, is that applying for the JET program is an entire year-long process. You, you gotta find letters of recommendation. There are a handful of different essays you gotta take. You have to get all these extra medical procedures. You gotta get all these different, uh, different vaccinations and stuff that you normally wouldn't get. And you even have to get a psychological assessment to make sure that you are okay mentally to do this. And then, and then, if you get past all that, all that... You get the interview with the consulate. And let me tell you, again, probably it's going to be its own video. But this interview with the consulate, they specifically are there to break you down. If you've never experienced kuki, like, like, kuki oyomi, if you've never been able to, to, to almost physically feel a room of, of, of tension and just tense, just, mm, this is where you're going to feel it. And I think this is intentional. I think it's absolutely intentional that they, they they give you this this sort of assessment of how are you gonna how are you gonna be when you're crunched like this? Because nothing bad was said, nothing was physically done, but the atmosphere of it, people's expressions or lack thereof, it was crushing. I remember some dude who was before me went in, like he was really big in photography and did a whole bunch of like photography in Japan and whatnot. He came back out and he said, well, I just embarrassed myself for 15 minutes. And I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> but despite all that, 
despite all the challenges, despite the year-long application process, I made it in. And I was first try, boys. Something that is extremely rare. Does not ever, ever seem to happen. And then came real Japan. Re and, and, and it was, it was, where do I even get started? I was placed in a little town called Komonocho in, in Mieken, in Mie Prefecture. Uh, about 20 minutes away from Yokaichi-shi, Yokaichi City, and about an hour out from Nagoya. And this was me finally experiencing what life in Japan was like unfiltered. There, there was no rose-tended glasses anymore. There was hardship. Uh, there was discrimination. There was hard days. There, were lo there, there was loneliness. But there were also a lot of good things, you know? Every day was an extreme. Sometimes it was an extreme good, sometimes it was an extreme bad. But it never was just a regular day. There was no such thing as a regular day for me uh, when I was in the JET program. I've got so many different video ideas to put together. I, in fact, I've already made a couple. Uh, whether it be here on Gaijin Perspective or over on my other channel, just, you know, Gaijin Google Media. There's still so much more I could talk about. <laughs> And while I did my best at teaching English, I, I really did try. I wanted to focus, I, I didn't want to be one of those, I didn't want to be one of those Jets who just went to Japan thinking that this was a two-year paid vacation. I really, really tried. But the thing is, is that English felt like a kind of a cover for my real job in, in the Jet program. And that was to be a grassroots diplomat. And it's there I found my love. Again, I was a bridge. I, I, was, I was a bridge helping folks in Japan understand what U.S. culture or foreign culture and foreign people were like, you know? That was, that was my life's ambition. To show Japan that we're not weird, we're not weird, we're not scary, and we're actually pretty capable of functioning within their society. It wasn't necessarily just about school, but it was more about the community that I stayed in. And you know, it was, it was through working with this community and being a grassroots diplomat that I found my, my love of Taiko. And that's something that has stuck with me over 10 years, despite only having a few years of actually being able to play it in a group. But after two years, I felt like I was at the zenith of what I could accomplish in the JET program, and that everything else that I was going to be doing was just going to be repeating itself, and I really wasn't going to accomplish any, any more than I already did, so I just kind of left. So I came back in 2011 to be with my now wife, but what was there? What, el what else was there? That was something that I had to struggle with for a really, really long time. I applied to, to several jobs working at different Japanese companies, and I did actually get a couple of interviews too, but nothing stuck and nothing felt right. It was a lot of sales positions. It really wasn't a lot of communicative positions or anything related to culture. It just, it didn't feel right. I. I was not acting as a cultural bridge anymore, and I knew that that wasn't where I needed to be. I was at a point where I was living with my parents and working retail, you know, and that's... I respect the, I, I respect the heck out of, of retail workers. Y'all work hard, but that's that, that shouldn't be an end goal. And after having come down from this, this high of, I'm this bridge, this cultural bridge of bringing people together and, and just... Being absent of that, it just felt horrible. But I eventually moved in with Aki, and I got an IT job at, at my, my old campus. And it was here that I started learning tech. Some of my earliest videos that I've made, I made while I was he while, while I was doing this job. That's why in the beginning, things like my audio quality were so terrible. I didn't know. But through that job, I did learn more and more and more and, and became better and better and better at it. I remember, I remember asking my boss, we had this big meeting, I remember asking my boss, can we work on personal projects if it gets us to learn the hardware and software that we need to understand for this job and to basically teach these, these new students? And they said yes. And that is the start of the biggest chapter of my life. In 2012, I started my YouTube career. And for nine years since, for almost a decade, I've been teaching predominantly about Japan's connection to popular media, uh, both with what I grew up with, what I personally experienced, and the new things that are coming out every single day. And the goal has always been culture. Always been culture. Everything that I've ever done, from 2012 to now, to 2021, 
every single piece of content that I ever made on the Game Theorist channel, on, on my Gaijin Guma channel, and on here. It has always been for the sake of culture. Always. I appreciate people giving me the title of teacher, but at my heart, I'm not a teacher. In my heart, I'm a student. And I kind of prefer it that way. All I do is just loudly share with, with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, the discoveries that I find that interest me. I've had fame through the theorist. It came to a point where when I was working with the theorist, when I would go to cons, I couldn't take three steps without someone stopping me to want to talk to me, shake hands, get pictures, etc, etc. But all of that was a side effect to the goal that I had set out. And that was to find a big audience and just teach, to explain, to, to, to just share all these discoveries that I had been finding, to, to, to tell people that you're actually smarter for the things that you love that society has told you that, that you're dumb and bad at. It was taking the spark of joy that I felt, that, that I had found from, from discovering a love of a country that, that so many other people were discovering uh, their own love for. A country that I, I, I came to adore, that so many other people did. And all these people were, were equally hungry with me for all this information that we could find. It wasn't just anime. It wasn't just gaming anymore. It was about finding more out about the country, about the society, and the people that developed it. Now, when I was living as an expat, the things that made me not like the experience were rarely due to Japan as a whole and Japan society. There were a handful of things that I didn't like, but the two big ones were loneliness and the type of work that I was doing. Well, now, I have my wife, and I have a ton of friends in Japan now. And if I was to go be an expat, I would hope that this would be my work. And that's what I want. My in, my new end goal, once all these virus problems are over, when all this tension is over, when we can finally get back to just life, I want to find a way to get to Japan. I've amassed so much of a falling over the last 10 years. I've I've made so many new I, I've I've made so many friends, I've made so many fans, I've made so many followers. And I wish, I wish I'd started that when I was still abroad. I wish I had that bigger stage that I that, that I could just show everything to you guys. Everything that I experienced living abroad. There was so much. I keep saying it. I've got so many more videos to make on these things. And all of this leading up to this point in time, this is how I fell in love with Japan. It, it's it's so funny because it's it's a lifelong journey that I didn't even know I was taking. You know, and I'm sure a lot of you can echo these feelings too. I didn't realize I was on this journey until my college years. And even then, I wasn't 100% sure about what I was doing. In fact, it really wasn't even until my YouTube career where I really solidified. And this is why despite all the negative things that I have said about Japan before, and that I will inevitably say about Japan in the future, I still love it with all my heart. And my 20 years of study of Japan has changed a lot within me personally too, in mentally, spiritually, and even sociological ways. It's something, and you know, it really is something that really does need its own video. 2020 was the first time, the first year that I, I haven't been able to go back since 2015. And like I said at the very beginning of all of this, of this half hour to 40, 50, almost an hour long video. When I reconnect with Japan and the, tr and the different trips that I take, I reconnect to the truest parts of myself that have made me who I am 20 years later. Was it fate? Was it a massive coincidence? I don't know. But what I do know is why I love Japan so, and the mission statement that I hope to exercise for 20 more years and beyond. To be a bridge. Not just one way or the other, but in both directions. A bridge to, to show Japan what we're like, what Gaijin are like, and to show everyone here outside of Japan who can't go over, who can't experience it, to show them the, the things that I found, both big and small. And I hope that that is a mission statement that I can take all the way to my dying day. So, thanks for watching, everyone. Like I said so many times before, I've got so many more videos to make. But I'm definitely going to be having a blast putting them together, whether or not I'm in Japan or not. So, 
Until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin, signing out.